Thank you, Brittany. Thanks for uh, having me out. Uh, really excited to be here for the first reach. So we're going to talk about um, how buyers have changed and sellers haven't. Um, these are like, you, you guys, you understand these. It's just what I'm going to challenge you folks on is we haven't leaned into these changes as much as we can. And this is a big opportunity um, you know, for us as running sales teams or sellers on how to lean and get, gain a competitive advantage. So number one, last 10 years, we have way more data than we did before. You know, field sales teams didn't use CRMs. Inside sales teams do. So now we've moved from like, how do I get the data to what do I do with all this? We don't lean to it enough. The buyer's empowered. We, we've talked about it a lot today. They, they're 60% of the way done there with their buyer journey. And uh, I want to talk about how we lean into that and align sales and marketing. And a lot of you, how many are doing SaaS revenue models, right? This is like the new, we're in the, we're in the, the subscription economy. It really changes how we think about sales. I want to touch on each one of those. And we'll start with uh, uh, the sales process side. Okay, so who's the buyer? Who's the seller? Who's the salesperson in this picture? Is it the good looking guy on the left or is it the helpful young lady on the right? Who do you think? Is it, is it the sleazy cigar smoker or the thoughtful academic? Is it the devil or is it the doctor? All right, it's funny. It's funny to think about that. Do a Google search for salesperson. Every single image on the left shows up and none of the ones on the right. That is ludicrous. Ludicrous that we like started this thing called sales. And what do they do? They go out and represent our companies with potential customers, and they're known as money-hungry, sleazy devils, and not as thoughtful, intelligent, diagnostic professionals. And that's the type of selling that I think is going to get disrupted. I get asked twice a week, is sales going to get disrupted by AI? Yes, the type of selling on the left. It's dead. Not even AI. It just doesn't work for today's buyer. And so we, we actually cause, we actually have names for this, like, Show up and throw up. Every, a lot of people in sales, oh, show up and throw up. That type of pitch is dead. We got alligator selling, uh, big mouth, little ears. If you do that type of selling, right? That's the type of selling that dies. And I think we have actually caused this as sales leaders, as sales enablement, as marketers in the way we build up our sales collateral. Okay, so I think a lot of times we take an inside out approach when we, when we create our products and enable our sales team. I think we sit in a room and say, okay, um, I'm building this product. I built this product that does these things for these people. Let me build a pitch deck for my sales team. Let me build a website that tells everyone about it. And let me have them go out and tell, tell the world about this. That's training our reps to do show up and throw up. And I want, what I want to show you is how to take an outside in approach to focus on the buyer first and help them understand the buyer and then explain to the buyer in their words and terminology and challenges and problems on how to pitch the product. All right, so I'm gonna take you through that process. Um, have you folks heard of Gone.io? Gone's an awesome company in San Francisco, maybe they're here. Love the data, they're finally bringing stats and research to the field of sales that has largely been anecdotal. Here's a study they did, I think it had 50,000 sales calls in it, maybe about 500 different companies. Um, the top reps on those 50,000 calls um, spoke 46% of the time. The worst performing reps spoke 72% of the time. Stuff we've known in sales forever, but that's the data, okay? And this is how the call looked, right? The top reps spread the questions through the call, and they switch speakers like every three minutes. The worst performing reps do all the questions in the beginning, okay? So we have to create sort of a blueprint for our folks to be able to understand this stuff. So this is the blueprint that I'll show you. There's like different frameworks that you can, that can use, but this is all hinged on the buyer journey. This is not a sales process built on our product. This is a sales process that's built on our buyer because of number two, I said, we're dealing with empowered buyers today, okay? And just so you think about it, like, just think for a second, ah, yeah, I get this stuff, but like, think of the first week or month of your sales training at your company. How much of it is about the product? How much of it is about the buyer? The sales training that I see, a lot of product stuff, not a lot of buyer stuff. Right, so just something to think about. So here's an example, buyer journey framework, awareness, consideration, decision. Here's what one looks like for um, a, a large, ooh, I gotta go back. This is what it looks like for a large uh, software organization based in Europe. They do about $10 billion in revenue. And so this is what they essentially use is, okay, before the customer even knows what I'm selling at the awareness stage, what are they talking about? 
as their biggest opportunities and challenges. Like this is a collaboration uh, platform. So lots of times they're trying to reduce their time to market and product development. Sometimes they're trying to get cross-functional communication going. I need to know that as a seller. And if they, if they do know, if they're trying to reduce time to market, what have they tried to do? Like, do they buy software? Do they hire a consultant to help them? Do they build something internally? What are they thinking about doing? And if they're gonna buy software, are they gonna go for the cheapest one, the one that's been around the longest, the one that integrates best? Ideally, from a sales perspective, I wanna know where my buyer is on their journey before I even tell them about my product. Because if they happen to be in a red box, that's not good for me. I don't have a product for the red box, but I can still sell them. But depending on what box they're in, the buyer, my pitch is so different. And so this is the opening training. Yeah, fine, let's tell our salespeople about the, the product, but gosh, this is getting, allowing them to get in the mind of the buyer. And as a sales manager, a sales leader, this is a question I can ask early in my check-in. It's like, where are they in the buying journey? And that will train them how to pitch them appropriately. Then I just got to align the pitch with it, okay? So thanks to the great work of Sales Loft and Outreach, we do a great job with prospecting guides today. What's in the prospecting guide, the cadence, et cetera, is I, I still see some, some issues there. I mean, how many of us are getting these calls? Here's, an, here's a company that uh, they do consulting for Shopify customers, okay? So they help e-commerce companies set up Shopify, all right? And so these are the calls I'm getting from Dwight. Like, hey, Michelle, it's Dwight from ICT. We help companies with their Shopify. This guy says the same friggin' voicemail every time. This is their cadence. Are you getting these calls? I'm like getting calls like, do you have a crack in your windshield? I say, no, they hang up. That's what people's jobs are. This is ludicrous. This is not selling in an empowered buyer. So, so I just wanna walk through like a little bit more forward thinking on how we can create these cadences and prospecting uh, better. It's three steps. First step is uh, third level data. Okay, public information. Are we training our reps on, yeah, go to LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn, check them out. But do we actually teach our reps what the LinkedIn data means? Do we actually teach our reps, like, what's the difference if someone's been at the company for a year versus six years? What's the difference if they studied psychology versus finance? What's the difference if, you know, they're in a, a C-level role versus a director role? These are all important things that create inferences for me on how I pitch them. It's a funny story with my 11-year-old son, just a side note. Um, uh, I, like, I was on a long call, with, uh, a car ride with him for like two hours. And I, this is actually a, a woman that, a company that we, we invested in for our VC firm. And I was doing a diligence call with her. And so I told my son, hey, do you mind if I just do a quick 20-minute uh, call with her? He sometimes liked to listen, like what Mike Gamson was saying earlier, like bring business in. He likes to listen to these things and ask questions. I'm like, yeah, listen to the call and we talk about it after. In fact, check out this woman's background on LinkedIn and let me know what you think. And I, I gave him my phone, he's like, checks out her background, he's like, Dad, Michelle's background is amazing. And I'm like, why? He's like, look, there's a bridge, and there's water, and there's buildings. And I was like, all right, <laughs> we got a little diligence training to do here. And that was his first lesson on, first, on third level data. But like, no, we gotta teach our reps how to do it. And then of course we got first level data in terms of the stuff inside, but what does it mean? How does a rep interpret if someone ignored eight emails but opened one? How does a rep interpret if they read a blog article? What do you do? And then translate that into a much more, you know, tailored pitch in their cadence um, around how I respond to that stuff. So I'll post these slides on my, on my LinkedIn profile when I go to the airport so you can have them, because I'm gonna go fast through a little bit of data, but if you wanna absorb certain points, uh, you can. The biggest value add I see here in, this, in, this, um, in this, this stage of the pitch, the prospecting, is to actually brand your discovery call, your call to action for discovery call, something that's super useful to the buyer. Okay, so I was literally just with a great company we're looking to invest in here in Chicago yesterday. And this is, they're gonna try this because they really think it's gonna work. It's worked for, for me at a lot of different companies. As an example, like at HubSpot, we would, we would get with a buyer and like start, like we have the first 30 seconds, we get their attention, we talk about some problems they're having, and then we basically pitch them on an inbound marketing assessment. It was a discovery call for us, but for them, it was an inbound marketing assessment. You know, listen, it looks like you're thinking about growing revenue, you need a little bit of help on demand gen. I work with your peers, I work with like 20 of your peers every quarter. And what I can do, if you're willing to, we can jump on the phone for 20 minutes, I wanna ask a couple questions on your demand gen strategy, your metrics, your conversion rates, and I will tell you how you fit against your peers. 
And I will tell you what your peers are doing to improve that. That's a, a discovery call for me, but that's a super value benchmarking tool for them. And that's the biggest upside I'm seeing in prospecting, is to label it, brand it, and get your reps to pitch it. It'll have a higher uh, conversion rate. Okay, so discovery. Discovery is easy. Um, I really just um, put together a one-pager that shows the, it's not a script, it's just the flow of a call. Right, like we just saw the data, first five minutes of rapport. What are some things I can do on rapport? Sports, kids, church, weather, whatever. Then the next 10 minutes is awareness. What are some questions I could ask about awareness? And then recap. So this is just a one pager that my inside people can have when they're, when they're pitching or my outside people can, can have as a way to train people how to be great buyer-oriented sellers, okay? And then um, here's, here's an interesting point on that, that piece. How many of you have a qualifying matrix like Bant or Medic? Anyone use Bant or Medic? Okay, so qualifying matrices have been around forever. Bant was invented at, I think, IBM like 30, 40 years ago. Medic, I think, was invented at PTC like 20 years ago. These are matrices that help us understand if a buyer is going to buy. But in our subscription economy, a lot of people are focused on customer value and retention today. And I've studied a lot of retention issues. Most customer retention issues are because of the way we're selling, not because of our product and not how we're onboarding customers. They're because of the customers that our salespeople are going after, and they're because of the expectations they're setting with our customers. And I encourage you, if that's the case for you, don't just have your qualifying matrix for selling, but have your qualifying matrix for customer success as well. Okay, we use the three C's at HubSpot. This tells us if they're gonna buy. This tells us if they're gonna be successful with our product. Okay, things like getting IT bought in. I can get a sale without talking IT, but most on onboardings are gonna fail if IT is sidelined after the contract and had no idea we were purchasing this. I can get a sale without checking that it integrates with their technical environment, but it's gonna bomb if it doesn't. Right, so just think about that with retention and subscription economy, customer value creation, think about adding your, your qualifying creation there. Now on the presentation side, I, I develop a lot of reps to be able to do that well. They're awesome discovery, and then all of a sudden they give the same freaking demo to everyone. If the demo sounds the same, you're not doing buyer-oriented selling. It's like, we have to use the information and change. Now it's hard, like the best, like born salespeople, which I think is like 1% of the, the population, they will always give a different demo. They're just natural born sellers. But we have to take mere mortals and turn them into that. And the easiest training wheels approach I've seen there is just like, I actually studied like hundreds of calls and I said, okay, what would the optimal demo be? Turned out that like these three options came up like 90% of the time. So I just created swim lens. I created those three options and I, I, I simplified it from don't give the same demo, give a different demo all the time, to do your discovery and then match it with one of these three options. And that allows us to be much more tailored pitching that all the data shows will actually work. And the same with customer success. I mean, do your customers buy and they go through, oh, we were working with Mary in sales, she's amazing, she understood everything about us, she told us we're gonna do X, Y, Z, we're so excited, and then you have a generic onboarding process. And they start with stuff that they actually don't care about. Right, so the same swim lanes can be passed through on the onboarding side as well. Okay, so that's a framework around this, this you know, evolved way of selling that's hinged, the buying journey, it's hinged on the buying journey and the buyer. It's not hinged on the product and the value. Okay, let's talk about data and aligning sales and marketing. Okay, I, I, was, uh, I ran sales at HubSpot for 10 years, so I talked to a lot of VPs of sales and I talked to a lot of VP of marketing, often in the same company. They hate each other. All those people and all you people hate each other in every single company, right? Every marketer thinks that sales are overpaid, spoiled brats. And all salespeople think that marketers do arts and crafts all day. And they end up like navigating back to their corner of the office and they do their trade show booths and they do their cold calls. And that is the kiss of death in today's environment that we all know almost every buyer journey starts in an area owned by marketing like the website or, or email or whatever, and it goes to an area owned by sales. And if we're not aligning them tightly, that's a competitive disadvantage. And if we do, huge advantage for us, okay? So I had a great partner going through this, Mike Volpe, our CMO for 
you know, to the IPO. And essentially what we did was we went away from this tradi traditional lead score. You know, I find with a lot of lead score, and when I look at it, there's like 50 inputs to it. And you can't, like, I don't understand why something's get a high score versus not. Like, I see a lot of, like, hot leads, which was like an intern that basically downloaded 72 ebooks. And then a, a CEO of a great company signed up to our blog and they don't even get a call. You know what I mean? It's like there's something broken in that mechanism. So we really simplified it to simply be the type of company and the engagement. And we're just shooting for AAs, but CCs were fine too. They were just a little harder to sell. And so over time, what we did was we would just evaluate every quarter all the leads that were generating each one of these boxes and what the close rate was. And if you multiply the close rate times how much they spend, so if in the AAs, if they on average spent um, $10,000 a year with us and we closed 1% of them, you multiply those together and those leads are worth $100 at the time of conversion. And so what that allows us to do is it allowed us to put um, marketing on a revenue quota. Right, I'll show you the chart on what that looks, but we could basically say like, I don't need this many MQLs, I need a million dollars of lead value. And if you get there through you know, 10,000 AAs or 100,000 CCs, I don't really care. I just know the math's going to work and we're going to get there. Not quite, but like, we get a lot closer than just like MQL values and, and lead scores. Okay? Now, sales doesn't get off the hook. right? So if, if marketing is going to take that level of accountability, then we do as well. So, so we all know that like, you got to call a lead fast. We all know that you got to call leads sick, you know, call, you know, call, I, I always had questions like, should we call them? If we get voicemail, do we call them in the afternoon? Do we call them five times or 10 times? Like, when do we give up? Do I give like a seller a thousand leads a month and have them call it once? Or do I give a seller one lead a month and have them call it a thousand times? Like, neither of those is right, but like, where's the right answer? So I studied it and I looked at like a bunch of leads that we had. Some of them were called twice. Some of them were called 15 times. And obviously, if you call a lead 15 times, you're more likely to get them on the phone, but that's expensive. So the y-axis was sort of a proxy around profitability. And so it allowed me to show, like, for the small business leads in the orange, the ideal number of attempts to maximize performance was five attempts. And for the mid-market, it was eight. And for the enterprise, it was, like, 13. Right? So now I could go back to the team and say, we've calculated the ideal behavior. We're going to put it in the CRM. And then we're just going to track it, just like we're tracking marketing on a daily basis. Right? So, so out came my speedometer. So if you haven't seen the great work from inside sales, I still find companies that their average response time on leads is hours. This is like such an easy change. If you get it to minutes, you're going like to increase your revenue by quite a bit. It's not, it's not hard to do that to build it in. And the data they showed is like the best time to call is 8 AM and 5 PM. And that's usually when the sales reps are grabbing their coffee and running, and then they're having a beer and playing foosball. So it's just like, encourage them to play foosball at noon and crank the calls. Like, wake up, crank calls, then take a shower, then bike to work, then do some meetings, then play some foosball, then at 5 o'clock, crank some calls. Right? Like, we don't really think that way. Right? So it really changes. And then, you know, we know that if you call a lead six times, on average, people are getting 90%. But most companies only call a lead once. Right? So easy fixes that we can then just build into an SLA, which is, just comes right out of the Salesforce, uh, or a, a, um, it comes out of the CRM dashboard. Um, so basically, um, this dashboard is the I don't, don't be on it dashboard. It means like if you're on it, there's a lead that violates the rules. It's that easy. You just build it in, and then both of these things go out to, to the team every day. Right? So where's, where's marketing against the revenue number? Every day. And when, how many violations do we have in our sales SLA? It goes out to the whole, you know, whole sales team, whole marketing team. Everyone's accountable. Right? That's our heartbeat to get to revenue. All right. Now let's talk about sales hiring. All right. So the first hire I made, well, eighth hire I made at HubSpot, number one seller at a huge public company in Boston. This person was number one out of 800 reps. I couldn't believe I convinced the person to come. They thought we were going to be, we were only 15 people in a garage across from MIT. We were a small company, no one had heard of us. Person joined, I roll the red carpet out, and they don't become our best sellers person. They're not terrible, but they're not our best. And I'm like, how is that possible? And I realized that 
the place she, the person was selling, they were literally running Super Bowl ads. Everyone knew the brand. Everyone knew what they sold. We, no one knew HubSpot. No one knew what inbound marketing was. The type of seller that's gonna perform in those two different environments, way different. This person, cranking calls, following a process. This person, evangelizing, new space. And I realized it's super dangerous to come to a conference like this and ask someone, what do you look for in a sales hire? Because it's, it's right for their context, but not yours. And so this is a place where data isn't used enough to be able to drive it. So I took a step back, even though the, there's no universal answer, there is a process to engineer your right answer. And a lot of you are on the rapid scale. And this is so important to get early because one day, hopefully, like Gamson, you get to hire 500 reps in a year. You better have more than art behind your ability to do that. All right, so essentially what I did was I just documented the 10 criteria I'm looking at, but I was really crisp around like, what did I mean by like coachability as an example? And what, did, what, what would a, uh, a number of like eight to 10 versus five to seven versus one to four? And so like this became a, a blueprint for my hiring managers for us to crystallize how we looked at good reps and something that we could iterate over time. So it's like, all right, fine, like now, I only hire four, let's say I have four people in Q3 here. Well, six months later, how do those four people do? Like, why did, why did Mary do amazing? And are we looking for that in our interview? And why did Bob fail? And are we looking at that in our interview? And we're constantly tweaking. So for two years, I just kept tweaking it. And over time, I eventually had enough data to do a regression analysis and actually see like of the quanti quantified observations I have, what's correlating versus not. And it's funny because the stuff that we typically think of with, with like salespeople like closer, objection handling, they were negatively correlated. And the stuff that does really well around like preparation and intelligence, that's like more like a consultant. So this really like statistically told me like what culture I want to build for the team. Okay, so these are, um, uh, oh, I'm so off on these things. This uh, the, my quiz, sorry, I didn't know. That. These three were all in our top five. I'll tell you what HubSpot's top five around 100 million in revenue. Intelligence, coachability, curiosity were all in the top five, but what was number one? How many think it was intelligence? How many think it was coachability? How many think it was curiosity? Everyone thinks it's curiosity, it was coachability. All right, so curiosity, close second, but coachability was the biggest, so that became my most important part of my interview was do a role play, five minutes, have them self-assess, coach them and have them redo it. That was the biggest driver for me on how I pick my people. And that correlated very strongly uh, with success. Okay, now what about the coaching side, okay? So sales managers, I see, I like, I ask sales managers, like what do you spend your time on? How much do you spend on like doing the job for the rep versus doing the forecast versus coaching your rep? And like so many sales managers do the job for the rep, like lead meetings and then do the forecast. The forecast can be done by technology. And when sales managers do the job for the rep, they get lazy and they get uh, nervous that they don't know how to do the job well. I want my managers to coach as much time as possible. So what's good coaching? I'm gonna use a golf analogy. Um, so I actually broke my hand golfing this year, which was interesting because my surgeon was 70 years old and he said, how'd you break your hand? And I said, golfing. And he said, I've been a surgeon for 45 years and I've never heard that in my life. And I was like, yeah, that says something about my golf game. Um, but I, I do love to look at it in terms of like how to coach. So one golf pro said, Mark, take a swing. And I did. And he's like, okay, um, turn your grip over, lean back in your stance, put more weight on your right foot, not your left. Think one o'clock, not two o'clock on the back swing and give me more wrist on contact. Like the golfers over there, they're saying, yeah, that's good, that's good advice. But dude, I was lost. You kidding me with all that feedback? Another pro said, Mark, take a swing. And I know inside he was like laughing because it was totally broken. But all he said was try this grip. Try this grip for 20 minutes, 100 swings, see how it goes. And after 20 minutes, I'm like, he's like, how's that feel? I'm like, you know what? I can see how that's a lot better. He's like, now try leaning back in your stance. And it's such a simple analogy, but I personally have promoted 20 reps to manager and they all take the first golf pros approach and see the rep do their first call and see 90 things that are busted and they throw up on them for 90 minutes with feedback and nothing gets fixed. 
But the best managers see the 90 things, but they know the one that's going to make the biggest difference. And they use data to diagnose that. Okay, so the technology, again, data-driven. We have the data now. What do we do with it? You know, we can put together these models that compare our reps on every stage of the funnel. Okay? Now, one thing I'll know, I want to point out here that I don't, I don't see this in most organizations is all the stages, confirm first meeting, needs verified, decision maker uh, verbal, those are buyer actions, not seller actions. It's not gave a demo. It's not booked a call. Those are seller actions. If you make it around buyer actions, a slight nuance, if you make it around buyer actions, the stages are going to be far more predictable of outcomes. Okay, so just a slight nuance, needs verified. That's a discovery call. I could say discovery call, but it's needs verified. And what that means is I did a discovery call. I wrote the prospect a one-third page uh, summary of what we discovered, and the prospect wrote back and said, that is correct. The buyer action. And if you measure the success of those, the percent conversion to customers is going to be much more accurate. Okay? Now, the other thing that I did was, in terms of taking a proactive approach to making sure that coaching was built into our program, you know, when I had 500 people on the team, I'd meet with the directors and say, okay, on the second afternoon of the month, you have 50 reps in your department. What are you coaching each one on and how are you going to do it? And so because of that, it trickled down to like every first day of the month, my managers had a one hour meeting with every rep and basically uncovered like, what are we going to work on together and how are we going to do it? And that was documented, driven by the data and documented with these very simple, like what's the diagnosis? How are we going to do it? And how are we going to measure the improvement? This is measure, this is holding my managers accountable to good coaching. If I go through this list of a manager and none of those metrics are being hit, what the heck are you doing, dude? You're not a good manager. You're not a good coach, right? So now I've got a track record over time to say, listen, you loved Bob. You hired Bob as a manager. And it's been three months you've been working on sense of urgency together, and he hasn't improved his close rate. So what's going on? You either are a bad at hiring or you're bad at coaching. I don't mean to be a prick, but like, you know, like that's your job, and we got to hold our managers accountable to that job. So this just makes it crystal clear for them. Okay, so um, the, in terms of compensation, I don't see this one out there as much. Like if you have a uh, rep attrition issue, and you, like in the beginning, you get a five or six reps, like they're just drinking the Kool-Aid, they have stock options there, it's awesome, you're building a company. At some point, it becomes more of like a, a regular scaling company role. This was used effectively to retain uh, my people. And so what I did was when they joined, I'm like, listen, I, the numbers are a little masked, but when you join as sales, you're going to get 40K base, 40K variable, and 5,000 options. So, and I know in a year you're going to ask me if you get a raise, if you get promoted. I don't do the, I'll do the annual review. Like, we're doing the monthly coaching. I'm not going to do the annual review. You get promoted, not in a year, you get promoted when those three things happen. You get promoted when you, you sell $60,000 of monthly recurring revenue. You, have, you average 5,000 a month for the last three months and when your, your contract size is six months or greater. That's when you get promoted. The fastest person got promoted in seven months. One person, like some people took like over 20 months. No, you know, sales is so quantifiable. Why are we doing the annual review with a 3% raise? Like that's how you get promoted. And when you get promoted, you get a 10,000 bump in your variable, you get more stock options, and there's your new goals. Our, like I think the average inside sales tenure is like 2.2 years. I think ours was like eight years. And they're just loving these tiers. And they're making a ton of money and it's worth it because they're high performers, okay? This is, I'll just let you read it. This is one I use for SDRs. The SDR job is the hardest job. Any SDRs in here? That's the hardest job in sales. Good for you. I mean, it's so hard. You're gonna get through it. You're not gonna be a lifetime SDR. But like this, I put together like six tiers. Actually, one of my directors did. Super, she was really talented. And you know, they'll go through these tiers every two or three months, getting access to better leads. Um, being allowed to go into sales training, having a bump in their commission, right? So you can read through like examples of what you do. That makes a 18 month journey as an SDR a lot more fun, a lot more exciting, a lot more engaging and motivating. Okay. All right, so the final piece I wanna talk about, which I think a lot of you are scaling. Um, here's a company, they're uh, augmented reality blockchain cybersecurity software company, which I made up, if you didn't know that. 
And they're 30 million in revenue, 70% growth. LTV to CAC is four. Logo churns 8%. They're cooking. They are crushing it. Now, the, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the failure, the failure rate for Series A companies, so your first round of funding, the failure rate is 70%, meaning they don't return the money to the investors. The failure rate for a Series C company is 70%. Dude, we suck at scaling. We are not eliminating uncertainty. And I think this is one of the big things that's causing, because what happened is this company raises 50 million bucks, and they end up expanding the sales team from 15 to 25. They introduce a new product to upsell, because like, we're starting to saturate the market. They, um, they, they introduce an enterprise team, and they start leaning to channel partners. I mean, this is a very common story. What's wrong with that? And a lot of them miss. And so this is the pattern recognition that I'm seeing is, while as entrepreneurs, 20 years ago before the work of Eric Reese and Lean Startup, we used to come up with an idea and sell vaporware. We sold customers before we built the product. It was terrible. And Eric Reese wrote the Lean Startup and Steve Blank did some great work, and now we've totally improved as entrepreneurs. We build MVPs. We do prototyping. We involve customers. We have this thing called product market fit. We've gotten so much better. But for some reason, when we're $30 million in revenue and we introduce a new product or we go after a new market, we get cocky and we don't do that. We say, hey, listen, oh, the, we just got this new investment and we tell the board, we're gonna go from 30 million to 50 million, 60, how are you gonna do it? We built this new product. We're gonna put it in the revenue line before we even know that it works. It's crazy. And so it kills us. So there's a huge over-optimism around product market fit when we get to that scale and we don't repeat what made us work in the beginning at Series A. And so there's been some great research on Harvard on how to do this. This is essentially, um, there's like three ways to scale. Like you're in one market with one product sound through one channel like inbound or cold calling. You can either go to another market, you can introduce a new channel to access people, or you can do a new product. I wouldn't recommend changing two or three of these at the same time, that's a lot of risk. You change one, and then you want to test it and set up your team. So I want to measure how each one of those are doing. I want to segment my business at this scale and measure the key metrics that I measure the whole company on. How much revenue is in each one of those boxes of selling through direct versus partners, selling to enterprise versus mid-market on this product? What's the payback and what's the churn? And that tells me where I'm ready to scale and where I need to experiment. So if I never look at that, I'd be like, oh yeah, Let's scale our enterprise business uh, through partners. Dude, it's not working. Like, the, if you go back, the, the payback's 18 months. It's not profitable work. We gotta fix it. So let's scale where it's working and let's run the lean startup with cross-functional teams to unplug new scale ventures, okay? So this is what my team would look like. It's like, yeah, I'm still gonna hit the 50 million, but I'm put all the reps in the places where I'm ready for scale where I have product and go-to-market fit. And I'm gonna have small cross-functional teams on the areas that I wanna experiment for like two months, five months, whatever it takes. And when we hit the numbers, we can scale those later. Okay, so that really helps us. So, uh, three things that I'm up to. So I am on the faculty of Harvard Business School. I teach a class in sales and a class in entrepreneurship. I've written nine cases. The last five have been about female protagonists, which um, the school's really trying to work on and I want to work on as well. So you can check out those cases. They're on my, if you just Google my name, HBS, you can see those cases. You might use them in your sales training. Um, I started a venture capital firm with a guy at Bessemer. Uh, his idea was the first VC firm that's run and backed by VPs of sales and marketing. Um, so we actually have 100 VPs of sales and marketing from Salesforce and Oracle and LinkedIn and Atlassian and all these places that have given us significant money so we can help with a stronger voice at the table when you're like in a couple million bucks to avoid some of the mistakes we talked about. And then the final thing, just a quick one. My other son, my 12 year old, he came down stairs the other day and he's like, dad, I can't sleep. And I said, son, you know what I do when I can't sleep? I read, but you can't read a good book. You have to read a boring book because a good book will keep you up. It'll engage you. But a boring book, you'll be asleep in like two pages. He's like, that's a great idea, dad. He hugged me. He went to the bookshelf. I grabbed a glass of water. I went to the living room. He's sitting there reading my book. All right, so, but anyway, I have this book that I read at the last stages of HubSpot. Um, I just want to say that I give 100% of the proceeds to build.org. Is anyone involved in build? 
I think they have a presence here in Chicago. They have a great one in San Francisco and Boston. They target the worst performing high schools in every major city where these kids are gonna end up in gains and that kind of stuff, like didn't have the life deck that we've been dealt. And they introduce them to entrepreneurship in their freshman year and take them through four years of learning entrepreneurship. The graduation from high school for those kids in this program is 99%. Matriculation into college is 85%. Way larger than the average there. So if you support the book, you support Build, check them out. Thanks for the time.